My name is Harry Baker. Harry Baker is my name. If your name was Harry Baker, then our names would be the same. It's <laughs> a short introductory poem. Um, yeah, I'm Harry. Uh, I study maths. Uh, I write poetry. Uh, so I thought I'd start with a love poem about prime numbers. Um, uh, this is called 59. Uh, I was going to call it Prime Time Loving. But that reaction is why I didn't. Uh, <laughs> so, 59. 59 wakes up on the wrong side of the bed. Realizes all his hairs on one side of his head takes just under a minute. So a cow that is because of the way that he slept, he finds some clothes and gets dressed. He can't help but look in the mirror and be subtly impressed how he looks rough around the edges and yet casually messed. And as he glances out the window, sees a side that he is blessed with of 60 from across the street. Now, 60 was beautiful. Perfectly trim cuticles, dressed in something suitable and never rude or crude at all. Unimprovable, right on time as usual. My on cue then a snooker ball, but like to play it super cool. 15, I wanted to tell her that he knew her favorite flower. He thought of it every second, every minute, every hour, but he knew it wouldn't work. He never get the girl because although she lived across the street, they came from different worlds. So 59 and my 60s, perfectly round figure. 60 thought 59 was odd. You see, one of his favorite films was 101 Dalmatians. <laughs> she preferred the sequel. He romanticized the idea they were star-crossed lovers. They could overcome the odds and evens because they had each other while she maintained the strict rules imposed on her by her mother that separate could not be equal. And though at the time he felt stupid and dumb for trying to love a girl controlled by her stupid mum, she'd have been comforted by the simple song, take 59 away from 60, and you're left with the one. And sure enough, after two months of moping around, 61 days later, 61 was who he found. He had lost his keys and his parents were out, so one day after school he went into a house and as he noticed the slightly wonky numbers on the door, he wondered why he never introduced himself before. She let him in, his jaw dropped in awe, 61 was like 60, but a little bit more. <laughs> See, she had prettier eyes and an approachable smile. And like him, rough around the edges, casual style. And like him, everything was in disorganized piles. And like him, her mom didn't mind her friend stayed a while because she was like him. And he liked her. He reckoned she would like him if she knew he was like her and it was different this time. I mean, this girl was wicked, so he plucked up the courage and asked for her digits. She said, I'm 61. He grinned and said, I'm 59. And today I've had a really nice time, so tomorrow if you wanted, you could come with her to mine. She said, sure. She loved talking to someone just as quirky. So she agreed to this unofficial first date. In the end, he was only ready one minute early, but that didn't matter because she arrived one minute late. And from that moment on, there was nonstop chatter. How they loved X Factor, how they had two factors, how that did not matter. <laughs> Distinctiveness made them better. And by the end of the night, he knew that they went together. And one day, she was talking about stuck up 60. She noticed that 59 looked a bit shifty. He blushed and told her of his crush, the best thing that never happened because it led to us. And 61 was clever, see, not prone to jealousy. She looked him in the eyes and told him quite tenderly, you're 59, I'm 61, together we combine to become twice what 60 could ever be. <laughs> and at this point, 59 had tears in his eyes. So glad to have this one of a kind girl in his life. He told her the very definition of being prime was the only one in himself could his heart divide and she was the one he wanted to give his heart to. She said she felt the same and as she knew the films were half true because that wasn't real love. The love was just a sample. When it came to real love, they were a prime example. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Um, so yeah, that, was, uh, that was the first poem that I wrote, and it was for a uh, prime number-themed poetry night, uh, <laughs> which turned out to be a prime number-themed poetry competition. Uh, and I became a prime number themed poetry competition winner, or as I like to call it, a prime minister. <laughs> and uh, this is how I discovered these things called poetry slams. And uh, if you don't know what a poetry slam is, it was a format come up with in America 30 years ago as a way of tricking people into going to poetry events uh, by putting an exciting word like slam on the end. <laughs> and um, what it meant is each performer got three minutes uh, to perform, and then random audience members would hold up scorecards, and they'd end up with a numerical score. And what this meant is it kind of broke down the barrier between performer and audience, and, and it encouraged the kind of connection with the listener. And what it also means is, is you can win. 
Um, and if you, if you win a poetry slam, you can call yourself a slam champion and pretend you're a wrestler. <laughs> and if you lose a poetry slam, you can say, oh, what, poetry is a subjective art form, you can't put numbers on such things. <laughs> um, but I loved it, and I got involved in these slams, and I became the UK slam champion and got invited to the Poetry World Cup. Uh, in Paris, which was unbelievable. It was people from all around the world speaking in their native languages to be judged by five French strangers. <laughs> um, and somehow I won, uh, which was great. Um, and I've, you know, I've been able to travel the world since doing it. Um, but it also means that this next piece is, is technically the best poem in the world. <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> Um, uh, according to five French strangers. Um, so this is uh, Paper People. I like people. I'd like some paper people. They'd be purple paper people, maybe pop-up purple paper people, proper pop-up purple paper people. How do you prop up proper pop-up purple paper people? I hear you cry. <laughs> well, I... I probably prop up proper pop up purple paper people with a proper pop up purple people paper clip, but I pre prepare appropriate adhesives as alternative to a cheeky packet, which is a case of paper slipped, because I could build a pop up metropolis. But I wouldn't want to deal with all those paper people politics, paper politicians with their paper thin policies, broken promises that are appropriate apologies. There'd be a little paper me and a little paper you. And we could watch paper TV and it would all be paper view. <laughs> We'd see those poppy paper wrappers rub about the paper package or watch paper people carriers get stuck in paper traffic on the A4. <laughs> paper. There'd be a paper princess Kate, but we'd all stare at paper Pippa. <laughs> and we'd all live in fear of Killer Jack the Paper Ripper. <laughs> because the paper propaganda propagates the people's prejudices, papers printing pictures of the footage into terrorists. It's a little paper me. And a little paper, you and in a pop up population, people's problems pop up too. There'd be that pompous paper parliament who remained out of touch and ignored the people's protests over all the paper cuts. And then the peaceful paper protests would get blown to paper pieces by the confetti cannons by the preemptive police. And yes, there'd still be paper money, so there'd still be paper greed. And the paper piggy bankers pocket in one, then they need purchasing the pulp to pepper their paper properties. Others live in poverty and ain't acknowledged properly. A proper poor economy with so many a proper poor, but. What I need to get ignored, the money goes to big wars. Origami armies unfold plans for paper planes, and we remain in prison in our own paper chains. But the greater shame is that it always seems to stay the same. What changes is who's in power, choosing how to lay the blame, then naming names, forgetting these are names of people. Because in the end, it all comes down to people. I like people. Because even when the situation's dire, it is only ever people who are able to inspire. And on paper, it's hard to see how we all cope. But in the bottom of Pandora's box, there's still hope, and I still hope because I believe in people. People like my grandparents, who every single day since I was born have taken time out of their morning to pray for me. That's 7,892 days straight of someone checking I'm okay, and that's amazing. People like my aunt who put some plays with prisoners. People who are capable of genuine forgiveness. People like the persecuted Palestinians. People got out of their way to make your life better and expect nothing in return. You see, people have potential to be powerful. Just because the people in power tend to pretend to be victims only to succumb to that system. And a paper population is no different. So it's a little paper me and a little paper you. And then a pop-up population, people's problems pop up too. And if the whole world fell apart, then we still make it through because we're people. Thank you. Um, I've just got time for one more. Um, for me, poetry has been the ultimate way of kind of ideas without frontiers. I, when I first started, the people that inspired me were the ones with amazing stories. And I thought, as a, you know, 18-year-old with a happy life, I, you know, it was too normal. But I could kind of create these worlds where I could talk about my experiences and dreams and beliefs. And so, you know, it's amazing to be here in front of you today. Thank you for being here. Um, if you weren't here, it would be pretty much like the sound check yesterday. Um, <laughs> And this, this is more fun. Uh, so this last one's called The Sunshine Kid. Uh, thank you very much for listening.
old man Sunshine was proud of his son. And it brightened his day to see his little boy run. Not because of what he'd done or the problems overcome, but that despite that, his disposition remained a sunny one. As I hadn't always been like this. There have been times when he tried to hide his brightness. You see, every star hits periods of hardship. It takes a brighter light to inspire them through the darkness. And if we go back to when he was born in a nebula, we know that he never was thought of as regular because he had a flare about him. To say the Midas touch is wrong, but all he went near seems to turn a little bronze. Yes, this son was loved by some more than others. It was a case of Joseph and his drinker and his brothers because standing out from the crowd had its pros and its cons and jealousy created enemies and those he outshone, such as the shadow people. Now, the shadow people didn't like the sunshine kid because he showed up the dark things the shadow people did. And when he shone, he showed the places where the shadow people hid. So the shadow people had an evil plan to get rid of him first up. They made fun of his sunspots. And shooting his dreams from the sky, their words were gunshots designed to remind him he wasn't very cool and didn't fit in with any popular kids at school. They said his head was up in space and it would bring him down to earth. Essentially, he came from nothing and that was what he was worth. He never gets to go to university to learn only degrees he'd ever showed be the first degree burns from those that came too close. Told him he was too bright. That's why no one ever looked him in the eyes. His judgment became clouded. So did the sky with evaporated tears as the sun started to cry because... The sunshine kid was bright, with a warm personality. And inside, he burnt savagely, hurt by the words and curses of the shadowy folk who spoke holes in his soul and left cavities. And as his heart hardened, his spark darkened. Every time they called him names, it cooled his flames. He thought they might like him if he kept his light dim, but they were busy turning lightning. She had terrible aim. And he couldn't quite get to grips of what they said. So he let his light be eclipsed by what they said. He fell into a lone star state like Texas and fell like even punched in his solar plexus. But that's when Little Miss Sunshine came along, singing her favorite song about how we're made to be strong and you don't have to be wrong to belong, just be true to who you are. Because we are all stars at heart. And Little Miss Sunshine was hot stuff. <laughs> the kind of girl when you looked at her, you forgot stuff. But for him, there was no forgetting her. The minute he saw her image burning his retina, she was out of this world. Yet she accepted him. The thing about this girl meant he knew whenever she was next to him, things weren't as dark as they seemed. He dared to dream. Shadows were nowhere to be seen. When she was there, he beamed and his eyes would light up in ways that can't be faked. When she grinned, her rays erased the razor tip words of hate. They gave each other nicknames. They were cool star and fun son. And gradually, the shadowy damage became undone. She was one in a septillion. And she was brilliant. Could turn the coldest blooded reptilians, vermilion, loved by billions from Chileans to Brazilians, and taught the sunshine kid the meaning of resilience, she said. But all the darkness in the world cannot put out the light from a single candle. So how the hell could they handle your light? Only you can choose to dim it, and the sky is the limit, so silence the critics by burning. And if eyes are windows to the soul, then she drew back the curtains and let the sun shine through the hurting. So in a universe of adversity, these stars stuck together. And though days became nights, the memories would last forever. Whether the weatherman said it or not, it would be fine. Because if you're behind the clouds, the kid could still shine. Yes, the sunshine kid was bright with the warm personality. And inside, he burnt savagely, fueled by the fire inspired across galaxies by the God who showed him belief. Thank you very much. <laughs>